full contact. In association with Mitsubishi Motors, drive your ambition. Hello and welcome to Brian Moore's Full Contact with The Telegraph and Mitsubishi Motors. We're just 18 days, that's all, 18 days from the start of the 2019 Rugby World Cup in Japan. And of course, uh, we'll be with you every Monday here on Full Contact for the entire build-up and throughout the tournament. Wales have named a squad good enough to win the Rugby World Cup, according to the head coach, Warren Gatlin. We'll see if the former Ospreys coach, Sean Holly, agrees. And we'll also get his thoughts on their defeat to Ireland at the weekend. As for Ireland, their win in Cardiff was much needed after their defeat at Twickenham. They're thrashing at Twickenham, actually. Uh, Joe Schmidt uh, now has a few difficult selection decisions to make believe they've sent their team in advance to Rugby World, but they've not announced it. So uh, whether that's mind games or whether he's genuinely in doubt, I don't know. We'll speak to the former Ireland second row, Mike McCarthy, about the squad and the prospects for Ireland. New Zealand have returned to the top of the world rankings after a brief hiatus. They've also named their squad. We'll speak to the former all-black captain, the great Sean Fitzpatrick, about whether they're good enough to make it three wins in a row. One man who won't be wanting that uh, because they're direct pool opponents but that means they won't play each other unless they get to the final thereafter delighted to say the first time on the show it's a former Springbok captain and World Cup winner Bob Skinscad Bob bit of a cliche but nevertheless true probably the most genuinely open World Cup there's ever been do you think? Well I think so it's a <laughs> It's a funny old thing, the World Cup, you know, the, and, and we're going to chat rankings and, and, and how those affect it. But this one, I think about a year ago, felt more open than it feels right now uh, because I think there's probably two or three sides who've, who've put themselves more in the running. Who, who are they? Well, I, you know, Wales are starting to be a contender, whereas a year ago, Ireland and Wales were, were a contender. England have, have, you know, put a bit of a stamp of authority uh, on, on their contention as well. Then... I would say a year ago, everyone, you know, po before the Autumn Internationals um, last year, everyone would have said New Zealand a shoe in. Now they're saying, well, hang on, a couple of teams I could knock them over. I thought they were slight favourites. I don't. I no longer think they are. I think it's. I think it's. You know, I think it's a dead heat. Yeah, and and that's why I'm. Teams. That's why I'm agreeing. So suddenly now it's more, much more open than it was a year ago, Including which I think team. is fantastic. Including the box. Oh, I think so. I mean, you know, they looked in disarray. 18 months to a year ago and and they've been they've put in some great performances um over the last you know rugby championship and and the end of year tour um last year and i and i think they they would contend themselves in as one of the top six in the world which they are we'll we'll go through that uh, and your experiences um a bit later on because uh, we'll need a lot of time for that Th this fabled gap between the northern and southern hemisphere teams that it, it was there definitely for for many maybe decades i think it's almost closed now isn't it yeah I, I, you know Fabled gap is is probably a good way of, of describing it because I I think you know potentially in a World Cup year that gap or even our perception of a gap opens and then closes again. You know I often think that the 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 Northern Hemisphere teams battle each other and in the old days certainly used to really muck it out in the mud and the rain and the slush and it was tough and there were tight games and there weren't big scoring and then South Africa playing New Zealand on a you know thirty degree uh, end of end of summer day, and and everyone goes, oh, that's a different team, but they haven't played each other. And it comes to the end of the year, and it's a thirteen ten scrap. So, I think it, you know, concertinas, um, and depends where the northern hemisphere are playing against themselves, and southern hemisphere the same. Well, we mentioned that, well, it was disarray, wasn't it? Everyone uh, I spoke to, all the staffers who live uh, in the Yarpy Triangle, which I live in, Wimbledon, <laughs> Southfields, and Earlsfield, and there are a lot of them. They were, you know, they were very discouraged. But Razi Erasmus, he's not had long. I've always said this: South Africa have always had the players. To me, it was a question of organisation. So simply that. Always had very good, very big, very strong forwards. When you've had uh, a number of um, is it right to say coloured or is it non white I don't know. What's the, what's the protect, politically what, correct term? What are the rules these days? I have no <laughs> idea. Mate. You, you should know. You know? <laughs> but anyway, they, they've brought an unpredictability about uh, the South African game because they've not grown up in that sort of direct running tradition like a lot of um, 
traditional South African backs. And, you know, wingers, extremely, well, difficult to mark because they are, they, they seem to make it up, but they've got athletic talent and uh, I think there's a bit of spark because of that. Absolutely. Look, re- re- reg- regarding the colour side of it, and, and what the rules are, don't know, don't care. We've got talent across the colour spectrum, actually across the age spectrum at the moment. We've got some older players, some younger players. Um, and I think possibly this team are, are, are starting to get young players um, come through who, who are more unaffected mm. by a, let's call it, uh, a, a politically infused divide and and are, are playing you know tremendous rugby captained by Sia Khaleesi who is a fantastic rags to riches story a, you know a kid who rugby got him out of a, a, a very difficult upbringing much much the same as like a footballer coming from the favelas in Brazil you, you're up against it he's he's overcome that he's gone and been the head boy of a traditional school that gave him a rugby bursary he's a fantastic leader and he's best mates with Eben Etzebeth who comes from the complete opposite yeah. spectrum um, and, and, and you know they're, they're tremendous mates so I, I think we've got a, a real opportunity now to cement a team that is representative of the whole lot and you know park the whole representation they're also playing like they really care about each other and the team and South Africa plays best when that's the case well the way I said the uh, the one minority should look at it is you've got all that athletic talent which previously has not been available absolutely and you're bound to find good athletes oh yeah no and talent talent's never been our problem in fact the the drain out of South Africa of the talent you know rugby and cricket is actually the biggest problem because now other countries are capitalising we've got their talent but how like, many are we up to three eighty is it, oh, I mean, is it they're, 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 you're right it's in the mid three hundreds I think of of players who are available to play for South Africa but don't play rugby in South Africa I mean that's traumatic. Because it's so early, the New Zealand fixture for for both sides, mm. it's one of these games. It, you could you could have a bad tw- first twenty minutes, and that seal your fate in relation to the pool. Mm. But obviously, they go separate ways. I don't think that's a bad thing for you, actually. Whichever way it turns out. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, South Africa's got two big t- taboos to break here. One of them is that no team that's lost a game has ever won the Rugby World Cup. Now, if they're saying that to themselves week in and week out, and then they lose that opening fixture, you're going to have that hanging over your shoulder. You know, and you know what it's like if you allow some doubt to creep into your mind. It likes to live there. So, so that's one. I, I think Rassi Erasmus needs to say, listen, treat this as a rugby championship game because we can actually beat them or lose to them. We've proven it by drawing with them this year, beating them last year, and it doesn't matter who wins that game. We need to prepare for the whole tournament. Both of the teams. New Zealand and South Africa will want to win that game to dominate a better path to the final. That's the first taboo. Second taboo is that New Zealand have been so dominant for so long in the crux games. Can South Africa turn over a close deficit at the end of that game? If they can, they'll still believe then that they could do it again at the final. Well, one of the things that will be interesting, more interesting in this World Cup than any other in my opinion, is because you've got the Tier 2 teams um, who on the day can pull a result off possibly and you've got five or six teams from tier one nations who genuinely have you know possible prospects of yeah. of lifting the whole thing it, whichever way you go first or second in the draw mm. it's not going to be easy oh no 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 no. i mean even you know scotland and ireland will will be a um one of those two teams at the moment uh, on on current form, but Samoa are, are, are looming large, and and one of those two teams could potentially be uh, the quarterfinal draw for South Africa or New Zealand, depending, you know, because you you play across the pool and one plays uh, two on the other side. So, uh, both Scotland and Ireland have proved very difficult for New Zealand and South Africa over the last eighteen months. Yeah, very quickly, England they had that long run. I didn't think they were as good as people were making out. That, to be fair, they didn't think they were as good either, and Eddie Jones certainly didn't think they were as good. Mm. Then, of course, people and the media being what they are when they had that brief uh, hiccup, everyone said it was he should be sacked and out, uh, and yet he sort of reinvented the, the, way, the way in which England have approached the game. And to be honest, I, I mean, I know him quite well. I've spoken to him ever since he got here about the things regularly, uh, to me, it's been more a question of just having everyone fit. Yeah, I think he's always had this in mind. So I remember asking him about the forwards and saying, do they have the ability, are they, are they good enough to carry the ball um, in the way that causes people problems? And he said, ah, now, mate, but there will be. <laughs> that was it. And he's now got them all available. 
And if they can carry on playing on the front foot, they'll be a handful. Look, Eddie Jones is a master tactician, you know, on the field, we know that. But off the field is where he comes to, you know, he, I'm not sure that he's got a pair. Uh, uh, I've seen him draw the best and last ounce of energy out of even depleted players at the right time, you know. So he knows. Any examples? Well, he's just, he's, you know, I remember him having a, a love-hate relationship with Victor Matfield. When Victor Matfield was best lock in the world, you know, he could easily have become a complacent you know, I, I win all the ball. I've got um, Bucky's butcher on the one side. He does all the the, the hard stuff and the grunt. I'll just win the line balls. And he was like, you know, do you want to be the best or do you want to be the best line out forward? And just constantly getting under the ribs. And 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 to be honest, to his credit, not not sort of vociferously going hard at him and 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 being nasty about it, but yeah. just goading him into being better. And yeah. and it really made Victor for me shine. For two years, I mean he was he was unpeerless un- un- in, in, in world rugby. And and as you know, possession is nine tenths. <laughs> you know, when when you're in a in a rugby game, if you've got a guy like Victor Matfield, and and I credit Eddie Jones with actually just daily work working on him <laughs> to be so I think, you know, he's gonna go to you know, Maro Toje, he's going to go to whatever loose forward combination he picks and he's going to say, guys, you need to be um, the the person that they talk about after the tournament as helping England to win it. But you've got to do that from right now. And and I really think he's starting to sink this England team into thinking like that. A pity um, from England point of view that he hasn't had an extra 12 months. Yeah. Um, but I've been very impressed at what they've managed to do pull out of camp, you know, the teams that they've played in the warm-up games. I know you can't take too much from them, but there's been a fluency there, which from relatively untried combinations in test matches has worked. And I I, I went down to the camp with a few other internationals and I was very impressed by the intensity, mm-hmm. the way it was going. And the one thing that they were trying to focus on is get leaders. Um, you, we, we all know... You don't have to speak to be a leader. You just have to do the right thing. You can lead by example and so on. And I think the finally, I think the fi- I think they're a bit scared of Eddie, yeah, because they don't want to. You know, it's like a cl- classroom. You don't want to be the one who's who's given a, a lashing, um, and well, therefore it, it, afraid to come forward because they don't want that. But I was I was saying to him, you know, in private, he is waiting for you to do this. Nothing will delight him more if you stand up. Doesn't matter if it's a row, whatever. Because you'll then see you've got the balls to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's a great point. Uh, and it, it comes down to a, a much deeper debate, you know, leadership styles, coaching styles. Don't forget that that of the World Cups that have been won, you know, S- South Africa's World Cup, Australia's World Cup, and one of New Zealand's World Cup have been won by coaches that whose tenures was hanging by a thread. Yeah. Graham Henry was literally out, except for a last-ditch attempt from the New Zealand board. Clive Woodward was gone. You know, but he managed to turn the board in his favour. Came back second time after the exit in in Paris in '99. Managed to win the 2003 World Cup. Jake White was exactly the same. Kitch Christie, in all the way in '95, had to beg for his job back because the players wanted to work with him. So, you know, Eddie's been through that once now. So he falls into a category, an elite category of guys who know what it's like to almost fail, have to throw everything at the job, and I promise you, he'll do anything. And the problem with that, what my personal problem with that, is that there may be player fallout, etc. But it's it's only going to be post World Cup. They're all going to be on board right now because they want the gains, they want the glory. You know, who cares if it's post World Cup? Well, if he gets the right thing, that's that's my point. They, yeah. You know, I care, but uh, for different reasons. I'm saying if we're sp- focusing on the World Cup right now, it is absolutely the right kind of coach that you've got there. Well, Wales, no longer number one in the world, but who knows how these rankings work. They seem to uh, change with the wind. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder how, how Warren Gatland is feeling about their warm-up games. I don't think they've gone as well as he would like. Why don't we speak to a regular contributor, always uh, insightful, um, the former Ospreys head coach on the line, Sean Holly. Hello, Sean. Hi, Brian. How you doing? All right, mate. Um, look, uh, <sighs> Relatively narrow loss uh, to Ireland in Cardiff. Um, Warren's always been the sort of guy who genuinely has said, look, I'm looking for certain things out of these warm-up games. Wins are great, but they're, you know, they are of lesser importance to the things, which I'm not going to tell you, but um, that I'm looking for. How will he have viewed the series of results and performances so far? 
Well, I think he'd be quietly pleased. You know, I think uh, the performance at home against a very strong England team off the back of the defeat in Twickenham you know, really would have uh, satisfied that his first choice 15 are strong enough in the big games. Last Saturday for Wales was all about getting a run for some of the squad players and probably confirming what he already knew about his final selection of the 31-man squad. It was a defeat, yes, at home, but a lot of young players on show and he was able to protect some of his bigger name players. So you know, I'm not so sure Warren would have been too comfortable with four big games before the World Cup, but as we spoke about in between the England games, Brian, you know, he does treat these games through a training phase. They've had a big week in uh, Turkey, which they've returned from. And I think he'll be pretty happy and settled with the squad, albeit without a, a Toby Falata, who's injured, of course, prior to the warm-up games. But he'd be in a, a pretty good place, I think. Um, he said that they believe they're good enough to win the World Cup. I, I, I tell you what I, I wonder about that. The, the depth of the squad, when you look at the... Because I thought it was a poor game, uh, Wales Island. There were a lot of mistakes made. And I understand why that was relatively new combinations in the middle of training things. But, it, you know, it looked to me that the sort of second, stroke, third choices may be OK if you have singular one or two injuries. If you have a wholesale changes, um, that's a different matter, especially at fly half. Who's going to get the, 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 the backup place, do you think? Well, Rhys Patchell came on and had half an hour, scored a try and showed what he can do. He's a real physical specimen. Uh, he's a little bit uh, type of player that uh, can do something on his day, but he's not consistent as the likes of a, a Gareth Anscombe and a, a Dan Bigger. So, you know, young Jared Evans had an unfortunate first half on the back foot, as you say, but it was a poor game and a lot of errors. Probably they, they lacked a bit of sort of cohesion and coordination that the first string 15 have already got. So, um, you know, that the unfortunate injury to Gareth Anska means that he's probably going to have to go with Dan Bigger as his first choice and Reese Patchell now. He's gone for just two tens um, in his final squad selection, which, you know, m- might be a mistake. We'll have to wait and see who will cover that third place should Wales get another injury. But, you know, in Dan Bigger, you've got a tried and trusted, con- consistent performer. Warren's words about the potential to do well in this World Cup are born out of his big players and his his known 15. Uh, when you get into the depth, then there is a slight concern. But what it will do, Brian, you know, there are players good enough in there to, to give some of those guys a rest, potentially in the Uruguay game, possibly the Georgia game. But I think the first choice team has to go hard against Fiji. We know what happened way back in 2007 against Fiji. Australia is the big one. But uh, if he can keep his, his senior players intact, Justin Tipperick, Alan Wynne jones Jonathan Davis, Ken Owens, then Wales could go deep into the tournament. Uh, Sean, Bob here. Um, Fiji, you mentioned, I mean, we, we, we saw their starting back line the other day and they would strike fear into the hearts of absolutely yeah. anybody. You want to prevent them from getting fast ball. How do you think he's going to play those, those loose forwards? You've got some outstanding players, but it's the combinations that, that, that the, the team have battled with over the last sort of six or eight months. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, the loss of Falato is massive. Ross Moriarty, his his durability is always in question. You know, removed from the bench last Saturday because of a training injury, Bob. And you know, I think Justin Tipperick is a shoe in for me. He's yeah. a world class talent. And Ross Moriarty will have to play you now at eight. The choice of six will be interesting because, uh, as I say, that that void is there. Aaron Shingler coming back after a long standing injury is a good one. A line up option. Where this line up has faltered a little bit in this these warm-up games. But the young man that's really impressed is Aaron Wainwright, the Dragons' young loose forward. He's he's one for the future and has performed really well in a red shirt. So I think that will probably be something that he look at. Those are the three that are, are possibly in pole position. Josh Navidi, uh, uh, captain with us last Saturday, there's question marks over whether he plays at six, seven or eight. But he's such a physical specimen, a Warren Gatlin-type player and a big game player. So... You know, there's four there, Bob. I mean, it'll be horses for courses in those. I think the Australia game will be Moriarty, Navidi and Tipperick. And that's the one, really, Gatlin will have his eye on to win the group because it sets him up a little bit better uh, to go even deeper into the tournament. Uh, just before you uh, go, Sean, I, I'm surprised, I, I don't know if you were, that uh, Rob Evans, uh, loose head's been left out to key. And, and in the warm games, the scrum creaked a bit. 
Um, any, do you know the reason behind this? I don't, actually. I, I scratch my head a little bit because, uh, as you rightly say, Rob Evans has been a big, big player for Wales the last couple of seasons. I saw him as a potential Lions candidate for South Africa. He's he's a good loose head scrummager, but he's very good around the field. A big man with ball handling skills. So, Rhys Carey has come in. Um, you know, one cap last weekend. He's only played one Pro 14 game for Cardiff Blues. He's transferred to Saracens, of course. And a lot of uh, talk about that in Wales because of the 60 cap rule. And now he's gone gone away. So it's a big call for Moran Gatlin. No Samson Lee as well, who has been a bit of a rock at tight head. And Thrum is king, as you well know, Brian. And it always is for me as well as a coach. And that's an area the opposition may look to target. But... You know, on the flip side of that, I'll say that Warren Gatlin is a master selector. It's what stands him out as an international coach, and uh, you've got to back him in that. So, question marks over that, but proof in the pudding. Just as an aside, Bray, the one guy I really do feel sorry for going into this World Cup is Reese Webb. You know, he's, he's probably Wales' best from half. He's unable to go under this 60 club rule. I've been gone to Toulon and not got 60 cats. And I think just this show showpiece tournament now when we've got one of Wales' best players unable to attend it but uh, who knows we'll see they'll probably um, amend it oh absolutely it would, oh, no it's ridiculous he would have qualified he's cutting you off know, the she... nose despite the face you know anyway um, a good enough squad to win the World Cup uh, I'm sure you will hope so but definitely one of the contenders mate it's great to speak to you again thanks and you mate all the best Wales are now fourth in the world rankings <laughs> Ireland could have gone top Gordon I don't, I, I, I don't even look at them now because of Bloody stupid. I mean, even Augustin Pichot, you know, vice president of World Rugby, says they're ridiculous. So, I, I, I mean, I don't even. I mean, he's, he's as opaque as a duck with Lewis method to me, um, which I can never understand. But I, I know it gives you some measure, but they're not relevant, are they really? Well, I don't understand the relevance. I mean, well, what is it? You know, at the end of the you don't year, win anything. yeah, I was going to say you don't win anything. So who cares what people think? What number you are? Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't mind actually. A, you know, a global ranking, and then at the end of a, a year, you know, we we talk about this this well, that, a global we'll season. A global, yeah, yeah. You know, one place four, two yeah. place three. Great idea. But at the moment, they they are like you said, opaque and and probably conjured up to create some excitement around around you know these test matches now because sponsors are missing out on on uh, the the autumn tests at the end of the year so uh, they're going to frustrate some people i mean i got phone calls from all over the world when when wales went uh, number 1 you know from from friends of mine and to be honest fantastic for, imagine for how three many people are welsh when that happens isn't it <laughs> I, I, they must have a population of 8 million 10 million 12 million <laughs> and they must all have been there um, yeah absolute nonsense um, and anyway in the world cup as you know it's just for 6 7 weeks that's all you no good before no good after mm. that period and well, the that's one... that's the difficulty you you could be flying but any you, other time you know that you the pools are set up based on on your um yeah. On your world rankings two yeah. years before. Uh, yeah. Well, that's ridiculous as well. Absolute nonsense. Well, it was rumoured that Ireland were going to delay the public release of their squad, but it has been announced today. Uh, one or two surprises. We're now going to speak to Mike McCarthy, the former Leinster and Ireland second row, who no doubt will have something interesting to say, not least about the exclusion, Devon Toner. Uh, who I understand has played more games under Joe Schmidt than any other Irish player, and he's not going. I think everyone's a bit shocked by that. You know, Dev's got 67 caps, um, and, you know, he's been an influential figure under Joe Schmidt while, uh, since Joe's been uh, coaching Ireland. He's literally played every game, and we know what Dev delivers in terms of calling the line outs. And there's been times where Joe has tried to tinker with the squad and not have Dev involved and go for someone who is more powerful, the likes of Tyke Byrne, you know, Ian Henderson, and, and as, as you said, James Ryan, um, to get that, you know, a real powerful player in a, a attack and defence. And, you know, it's a, it is a shock to see Dev left out because what we've seen is when Dev doesn't play, the the um, the quality of the set piece, um, the scrum and the line out, more so the line out, um, re really suffers. Uh, so that, it is a really big call because while Ian Henderson and James Ryan can call the line outs, they aren't that experienced in it. And when it comes to, you know, uh, after the pool stages, a quarter final, a semi final, not to have an out and out line out specialist calling forward there, um, 
you know, it's it, it, it is a bit of a risk. So yeah, I was shocked to see Dev Dev left out. Well, James Ryan, he came back and uh, yeah. it's arguable that given the importance of lineouts now, absolutely crucial to momentum and possession, that he's one, if not the most important player at the moment. Um, could they survive without him? You know, James Ryan, he's a phenomenal player. The, the amount of work he gets through... He's incredibly physical. Um, often carries into into heavy traffic, and he, he gets real good gain line for Ireland. Gets gets uh, gets them to win the inches, the momentum, which which makes life easier for everyone else to play off. And he, he's an important figure going forward. We, we've seen how Ireland have maybe struggled in the in the last six six nations in the phys- physicality stakes, uh, losing to, to Ireland at the Aviva and um, getting out muscled against Wales at, Wales at the Millennium. So um, Joe's obviously taken some learnings from that and that's why you know the likes of James Ryan Ty, Ty Furlong um, Ty Byrne sorry um, and Dev, Dev's left out maybe Mike Bobskin said here um, you know if Ireland if all goes well and, and according to plan in, in pool play um, this team takes on potentially one of South Africa or New Zealand, you know, minus a Devon Toner, like you said, in, in, in the set pieces, which are so crucial. Yeah. Do you think that's why Brian O'Driscoll is, is, is tipping England? Is he, is he worried that there's not enough left in the tank? Yeah, I think looking at that game where England played Ireland a, a couple of weeks ago, you have to say uh, England are looking incredibly strong. And I think for it, from England's point of view, if they keep, if Mako Vunapola is fit, Billy Vunapola, um, Tuolangi, uh, you know, those guys, Atoji and Farrell, if they can keep those four or five guys fit, they, they, they'd have to be one of, you know, the favourites to, to possibly win the World Cup. I thought that display against Ireland was just, they absolutely crushed them. It was, it was the same last year at the Aviva where they beat Ireland in that first game. The, the physicality and the collisions those guys bring to, bring to the squad is pretty phenomenal. But, um, you know, yeah, Ireland have got a tough first game against Scotland. Um, and then, you know, who would you rather play, New Zealand or South Africa, if you get to the if you get to the quarterfinal, two incredibly tough games. I think Ireland would have, on pass form, would have taken South Africa. But we've seen the resurgence under Razi Erasmus, who who knows this Irish side very well, having coached Munster. And then also they brought in Felix Jones, who was coaching Munster last season. And his his role is to look at the Northern Hemisphere defences in terms of what they bring. So Felix Jones is going to be able to give an incredible insight as to you know the plays Ireland use, how they look to approach the game. So that if if Ireland plays South Africa in the quarterfinal, um, Felix Jones' kind of in depth knowledge of how how Ireland work is going to be invaluable for South Africa. Well, Joe Joe Schmidt said uh, you know that he was really disappointed that it it had to happen that way. He wished Jones very well, but he was he was hoping yeah. then that it wouldn't uh, affect the World Cup. I mean, that's a really difficult thing to happen. I mean, Jones has probably got a playbook. Um, if I if I know uh, Joe Schmidt well, I mean he's a yeah. master, you know tactically he's outstanding, but he's a he's a long term planner, um, and and he would have been talking with his team in and around um, the the future from from a long time ago. Yeah, I mean I think it's it's common knowledge now how like I've never worked with a coach you know who goes into much depth in terms of analysing and. I've I've never seen anyone better in terms of coming up with plays which uh, worked around looking at footage of opposition and a, and a play that breaks down the opposition. Um, so that that that'll be a massive blow to see Felix Jones go go to South Africa and um, you know Joe's Joe's very um, you know he doesn't he doesn't like the media knowing you know about team selection. It's one of his bugbears is when the media name the team before it's been announced. So. Uh, that'll be incredibly frustrating to for Joe, and you know it's obviously a massive positive for Razi Erasmus and South Africa should they meet in the quarterfinal. Mike, uh, one last question: um, Ireland's relatively poor form, and that's bearing in mind where they got to in 2018, has lasted yeah. since that win. There've been one or two wins that have been okay, and bits and you know there've been odd periods where they've they've played as they were doing in that long run of wins yeah is it it hasn't been as impressive if you're at all objective about this as i'm sure the irish side all the fans and joe schmidt would want do you think that is symptomatic of of anything or do you think it's just a question of form fitness availability and so on I think I think in Ireland the bar's been set so high by the team in terms of what they've achieved 
They beat the All Blacks for the first time in 2016. They went on to beat them in 2018 at the Aviva. They won the Triple Crown in 2018. Uh, series win in Australia. They beat South Africa, uh, I think, 2016, the first away win ever. So the bar has been set incredibly high. And to be honest, I, their form hasn't been good. There's no doubt about it. They were, you know, the last six nations I referred to that first game against England, the game against Wales, um, the game, the warm-up game against England at Twickenham. They, 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 they lacked physically um, and they were really shown up. But I suppose the way I was looking at it from my point of view is you'd rather be going into a World Cup um, under the radar a bit rather than being, you know, everyone expecting you to be amazing. So I'm hoping that plays a part in it for them. But there's no doubt, I'm not sure if teams have started to work out their game plan and um, just brought a physicality. Like I said, that game at the Aviva with England, uh, England just brought a physicality and... Um, that Ireland just were unable to live with. So I'm not sure if teams have started to work Ireland out in terms of their game plan and realise what they need to do to beat them. But uh, it's, yeah, it, it is a concern. And, um, you know, they'll certainly look to, I think this week we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about Ireland this week because, you know, they played Wales last week. I think as Wales' is second team. It wasn't Ireland's strongest team. And I'm sure both teams will go as strong as possible this weekend at the Aviva. So they'll be, we'll take a lot more learnings from the game this weekend. Well, Mike, only 18 days before it all starts, so we won't have to wait long to the answer to that question, but it's good to speak to you. Thank you for, thank you for speaking to us. Thanks for having me, guys. Cheers. Just before um, we conclude this bit, you mentioned England, and I mentioned right at the start of the show about the availability. And what I've said is defensive systems are good now. They're very practised. They can cope with a certain number of runners. Even, I say, um, I don't want to patronising, you know, tier two teams who are not as talented, they can cope with two, three, four, five runners. If you have one or two more runners than a defensive system can cope with, it just falls apart. And when England have all their available ones and they handle well, they're very difficult to stop because the ability to offload, the ability to time their runs, the right angles, and the number of players who do that. Because you've got to remember, carriers don't have to be big. Noel's a good carrier. May is a very elusive character in certain ways. And it's the first time under Eddie Jones that he's had every option available. The question for them now is, can they keep that form up? Does he tinker with it? What does he do with it? Um, and also, uh, what do they do when the uh, game swings against them? But the way in which um, they can create ball and create momentum, as this incarnation is the best that Jones has had available to him, the best that I've seen him. I think you make a great point. You know, you talk about number of carriers. Think about the, the the great sort of back forward combinations. I mean, you know, even as far back um, as as World Cups that we've seen in the past, if you've got a big headline player running at you, two people are interested in in defence. You know. England haven't had a big... They tried it with Ben Teo. He didn't really come off in that big bossing 12 role. Tuolangi is absolutely their player. We saw him rip apart New Zealand on his own two years ago. He's been back. Suddenly, the outside gaps were on because both centres had to say, hang on, I cannot, I simply cannot leave my defensive channel until we've dealt with the threat. And... You know, Eddie Jones knows that, and that's why he wants carriers. He wants, you know, Vunipola to, to carry the ball, bring two people in, you, you know, take a six and a 12, and then when you run your backline move, by the time it gets out to, to Johnny May or, you know, like you said, Jack Knoll, they've had three people have to check a run. And, you know, we've seen at this, at this level, you know, one meter outside the gap, you're away. You're when absolutely you away. Rely, when you can rely on props, like Vinopola and Sinclo, but deft hands can offload, can take contact, can do the back, you know, that back deep pass. It frees everyone else up because you, you can you can trust them to be there. They don't get in the way. Best example this weekend was Maro Otoje took a short ball. Nine times out of ten, that goes behind his back, creates space, and George Ford has done a long looping pass, and you know you've got one of the wingers in in the corner. He took it. Brilliantly ran a great line and he's he's in under the poles. Now the the difference is that is if, if your defensive consultant, whoever yeah, it is, that. is watching that video, he goes, I need three people to tackle that guy. <laughs> you know, so that he runs three lines like that and then one goes behind his back and you've got a guaranteed try on the corner. So I, I think they're in a good wicket. Full contact in association with Mitsubishi Motors.
everyone's ambitions are different. You can climb to the top, or you could take on uphill battles of a different kind. You can explore for hundreds of miles, or you could begin a bigger journey. You can make time fly, or you could make it stand still. The Mitsubishi SUV range. Drive your ambition. Well, we've got one international captain right here in the studio. We're going to speak to another now, another World Cup winner, Sean Fitzpatrick of the All Blacks is on the line. Hello, Sean. Hello, Brian. Uh, how are you? Very good, thank you. Good man, New Zealand. Uh, uh, after being dispatched from the top of World Rugby for about 10 hours, <laughs> they're now <laughs> back. Um, look, 31-man man squad's been there. few questions. Starting 10, is definitely Borden Barrett or... What about uh, well, yeah. I, well, I think I think more what we saw in the definitely in the championship um, was that they were trying a different game plan, um, and by having Barrett at fifteen, uh, just gave them another string to their bow. Took a few games to to work it out. Uh, the execution in the, the first two or three games when they were using it uh, wasn't great, and. Uh, he stuck with it uh, for that last game against Australia, and and it paid dividends. So now, now more they have you know two or three different ways to play, and you know they can go back to Barrett at, at ten and Smith at fifteen. They know that works, um, but they now know uh, that Moanga at ten um, is a definite option uh, going forward, and, and they need that. They have seen in the last you know two or three years that. The teams that are shutting them down are the teams that have a very good rush defence, like South Africa, um, like Ireland, like England. Uh, so they needed other ways to try and break down that defence, which which they achieved in, in, in degrees against South Africa, um, but definitely in that second game against um, Australia, um, it really paid dividends. So I think all in all, um, they're quite happy. And whether they start with Moanga at 10 or... Barrett, you know, I, I don't think they're too fast, but I suspect against South Africa game one, which is such a huge game for the All Blacks, and quite it's quite different in terms of past World Cups because they've never been in a situation where they've had to you know, be ready to go all guns blazing game one of a tournament so I wouldn't be surprised they started Barrett at 10 and some other 15 against, against South Africa Well, almost 2,000 caps between the squad, do you having New Zealand have always had good World Cup squads. Do you mm. rank it as highly as uh, 2011? 15. 15, um, 11. 11, 11. 11 was, I think, 15 was a much better team. I think we had a had a really experienced team in 15, learnt the lessons from 2011. Um, and experience counts for so much. But in saying that, you know, they've, they've moved Mr. Franks on, which was a a massive call um, and a tough call. But when you look at, you know, what these props have got to do today in terms of being able to carry the ball, but obviously their first job is a scrummage. Um, But these guys, uh, Tuonga Fasi, Lalaula, those sort of players uh, able to carry the ball 10, 12 times um, and damage opposition. So, you know, it's become quite clear that you you need ball carriers. And... um, you know, I'm I'm quite happy. The thing that probably concerns me more about the the All Black squad is the, the couple of injuries they have. You know, they're taking a big risk with Barrett, but they they see that uh, sorry with um, Retallick, um, but they see that as a, a risk worth taking. He won't he won't play until quarter final time. His shoulder's not not ready yet, and also Moanga has an injury cloud over him. So this World Cup is going to be uh, a team that has a little bit of luck, and and injuries are going to play a, a big part, I suspect, in this World Cup. Uh, Fitzy, um, Bob here. Hey, Bob. I'm good, buddy. How are you? Good, thank you. Good man. Um, Brody Retallick, you you mentioned. Um, I, I'm I'm sort of thinking back. There are not a lot of All Black teams that have had to take risks like like, like that. Um, mm-hmm. Is is he that big and that good a player? You know, can, can they can they draft in um, Barrett? Well, I'm not sure if the suspension will be over now. Uh, to, to to cover it in that in that game against South Africa, would it make a big difference? Uh, Barrett Barrett will be back, his suspension will be done by then Um, but I suppose the benefit of of, um, Brodie being out for the last sort of 
four or five tests is that other players have had an opportunity and I, I thought Tua Kaluta was quite outstanding. Um, but I, it's a risk worth taking because the set phase is so important, especially the line-out, and, and he's a master at that. I, you know, he's, he's one of our key players. And in the last, you know, five, six, seven years, he's, he's been quite outstanding. Um, and when you come up against teams like South Africa and England, who have outstanding lineouts on attack, and more importantly, probably on defence, uh, you need you need a strong lineout. And and I just, you know, he is <laughs> he's probably our, our most important player, other than other than Barrett. I, I you know, those two are going to be key to the success of the All Blacks. Yeah, and he's and he's a. I mean, you know, he's he's been multifaceted as well, moving mm. the ball on, um, a, a running, you know, in yes, in the yeah, tight right. five, someone who's carrying the ball as well to get yeah. him the ball. Though I'm sure you've had wonderful debates with uh, Moro and amongst others Stuart Barnes about, uh, let's call it clever breakdown play from uh, New Zealand. Can we expect Cheeky. the same? <laughs> Moro shouting at me in the background there, but can, can we can we expect the same stuff from Sam Kane, Adi Sevier, Matt Todd? Good enough at the breakdown to dominate for New Zealand? Um, I think so. I think you know, Sam is learning his trade still, um, and he had a, a phenomenal championship. I thought he was outstanding in the Super Rugby. I had a had a good championship. Uh, learned a few lessons, I suspect, in that game in Perth, uh, where they got totally dominated. Um, but yeah, it's interesting the, the the twin sevens probably going at it as we saw with England a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's you know it's a good ploy, uh, but you need all three of them to be firing. And you know I thought uh, Reed was was very good in that game, uh, the last game at Eden Park, um, which has been a little bit of concern going forward in terms of his form. But he seems to be back to to his best. Um, but you know the dark arts of 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 the breakdown, you know, it's no different to anyone else. We're all looking to get an edge somewhere, and all three of you have to work well. And that's, you know, you know better than anyone. You know, if if the other two guys in your in your trio aren't up to it, um, you know, Richie McCaw can look pretty average when 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 Reed didn't play very well. Um, for me, Reed is absolutely even more than than. Uh... Even more than uh, Retallick and whatever. I think mm. what he brings in terms of ball carrying, but his example and so on. And experience. Yeah, I mean, experience. For I, the big you know, moments. I, I, I wouldn't worry because it, it can be covered in certain ways, but I think his contribution is so much more than you see even yeah. on the field. Mm. You think, um, um, Bobby, the, the breakdown is so important now, and if you, if you are not physically dominating the breakdown and putting the opposition, the attacking team under pressure, um, the defensive systems become so much better. Um, if you can really dominate that breakdown and, and commit the opposition to having to put in two, three, four men into the breakdown to look after your own ball. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's it's a different a different game. And that's what we saw in those last two games against the Australia. Um, totally dominated at the breakdown on Perth. Uh, they had a field day, and then the flip side at Eden Park, where we dominated them. Um, they didn't even come to the party, uh, which is which is a real telling factor in terms of how you operate your your six and your seven. Well, I think you know one of the big factors for me, um, and you talk about the, the the chasm between if you if you're playing well, if you've got good, well set, um, mm. you know, sort of let's call it rucks and malls or, or secondary possession. South Africa have, have really worked on it. Fuff de Clare coming through the line and you know putting pressure on nines and tens very quickly. Um, you know, six, seven, and eight are all important in stopping that from from happening. You know, you got to protect that ball. And I think uh, if New Zealand look back over the season, they'll say we did it once against Australia and we dominated at Eden Park and, and you know, the match before we didn't, they let, they let Nick White, I think it was absolutely yeah. roam free. And, and that sort of attacking defense, I think they, they, they call it is, is uh, something that everybody's going to be trying to employ against them. So they're going to have to get it right. Yeah. It's a real, a real art now. There's a, there's a huge amount of work that goes on in terms of game plans. And then, and then, and then the issue is <laughs> being able to execute it. And that's the, the key. Um, being able to have the skill sets to to execute a, a game plan that's you know it's not easy, not like our day, Moro. 
Oh, no. Well, the thing is, everyone had to go in because <laughs> you still could retain possession if you, yeah. were, if you were going forward. So there was no yeah. choice. Sean, always great to uh, speak to you. Have a good World Cup, mate, if I don't see you before. Excellent. Cheers, guys. Cheers, mate. Cheers for tea. Lions tours for British and Irish players are huge because when you're being chosen as out of one of four countries as opposed to your own country, obviously the competition is is better. Because you only get one every 12 years, um, you, you you may miss one, actually, if, if you're not and be one of the best players you've ever produced. But that's the way. The World Cups, South Africa, like Australia, uh, it doesn't matter what their form is before, they've always done well. You know, to me... The, the bloody mindedness of, of the players to to do that is is one factor. Um, but I mean, you you would woke up in ninety nine two thousand and seven. Um, what do you remember? Because I I I, I do remember the Teichmann, um not being there. Your young player. Um, what was that like? Oh, it was difficult tomorrow. There was, um, I, you know, I was a player, not unlike yourself, actually, who managed to polarise people, some some very much to the good. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> and some, some of it to the bad. And, you know, remember, I was a young English kid growing up in a very Afrikaans-dominated sport. So I think at Stellenbosch University, I only found out halfway through that Skinstad was actually Scandinavian, not Afrikaans. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was I was incredibly lucky to, to play in a couple of World Cups. I missed 2003... Um, I broke my arm in a warm-up game, um, and you know I, I would have loved to have done it th- three in a row. So, so although two thousand and three ended badly for South Africa, but um, well, I mean, you, you badly you, you you extra time defeat Australia went on to win it. Do you look back? Do, do you think the members of the squad look back and think we could have done that? Oh, look, I mean. I mean <laughs> got to say Tim Horan who's become a close mate of mine had the finest game I've ever seen you know from an inside center um after a week pretty much he said close to his deathbed he he was he literally didn't train all week came out a man of the match in the in the semi-final and the final so an outstanding performance by him and individuals to turn tournaments like that you know so uh 99 we lost to Tim Horan on song and a uh, Bernie Larkham uh, 65 um, yeah. yard drop goal. But I think, you know, being part of that squad, I'd, I'd come through what, you know, was a, a sort of a pretty much um, set in stone path to playing for South Africa. That, that was a lot easier. 2007. This I'd, won't make you feel any better. I've just been told yeah. it was his first international drop goal ever. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> they made an advert about it. They, <laughs> they said, give it up, Bernie, because, you know, they said he was practicing drop goals and he was never going to get one. And then, of course, he got one to win the, the semifinal against us. But, you know, he's a lovely guy and, and um, it, it was an incredible kick. I'd, I'm not sure, even sure if it was planned. I've seen the, the, the replays of it. It makes me shiver every time I do. You know, and then for me in 2007, I'd, I'd probably fallen out of love with rugby a little bit. Um, I came over to the UK. I played a lot of amateur rugby, played for the Barbarians, which really rekindled the thoughts of, of wanting to play. And, and, you know, Barbarians, you still play a high standard. You play test match rugby. I realized if I, if I got fit enough uh, uh, again, I'd have a chance. And the Sharks gave me a chance. And, and that ended up in a, in a fairy tale going through to the end of 2007. So, well, it did. And funny enough, last uh, week, co host was. George Shooter, the English hooker, who played in that tournament, who were getting his memories of the drubbing 36 0. I mean, that w- it was an extra ball performance by England. And I wasn't alone in saying, you know, they're, they're not going to go any further. And, and yet they did and get, got there. When, once you've done that to a team, that surely must give you absolute confidence. If yeah. It, well, look what just happened with Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. You know, I, 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 to be honest, it actually. I think it, it allows you then to be confident that if you do everything right, you you know a good good big one will beat a good little one. You know the the, the 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 boxing analogy. We were a better team than England at the time, and and barring a bit of luck, us playing well and them playing well, we should have beaten them by ten points, which is what happened in the final. Not the thirty six nil. Thirty six nil. I mean, yeah, we had the ball on a string. You know, Monty didn't miss anything. We made you made four breaks, four tries. I mean, it was literally uh, a, a, a dream performance against a, a really battling, you know, tough, bloody-minded English team who I think internally weren't loving each other all the all the time there. So they wanted to take it out on us anyway. Well, George said, "Look, 
he said after that, he, he couldn't get any worse. Oh, exactly. So we'll give it a go. Yeah. No one expects us to win the final. Sometimes when the pressure of it goes. Um, Eddie Jones, he was there, wasn't he? Yeah, Eddie was there in, in 2007. Um, what what degree of um, well of success do you, do you attribute him with? Because obviously he wasn't the main. No, no, no. I mean, he was a, it, it was a funny old relationship. I mean, he was a sort of a consultant, I think, brought in by Jake White, who had a lot of respect for Eddie and his tenure, um, you know, with the Australian team, the organisational uh, structure that he'd done around training. I mentioned earlier some of his, his psychological bombardment of, <laughs> of players and, and goading players performances out of out of players that nobody had seen the like of and and he was exceptional at that he was a, a really really effective I would say not a consultant he was a very very effective assistant coach in in the coaching group and willing um, to take the subsidiary role because very much so you know when and, you see I, him you speak to him now you can't imagine him ever wanting or ever accepting that sort of position no I, th I think he was very smart about it I think he'd he'd obviously made peace with the fact that Jake was the head coach he made contributions where he could he didn't step on toes and 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 sometimes having possibly less pressure on you to do all the media stuff, et cetera, et cetera, creates more opportunity to do the interactions with the players, uh, the, the little extras that, as you know, makes the biggest difference. Well, that's all we have time for this week on Brian Moore's Full Contact in association with The Telegraph and Mitsubishi Motors UK. Thank you to my co-host, Bob Stintiat, and thank you to all of our guests. Please do subscribe to the podcast to make sure... You don't miss an episode every Monday. It'll be during the World Cup and beyond. And if you want to leave a review, don't care what it is, be as controversial as you like. But for now, it's goodbye. Full Contact. In association with Mitsubishi Motors. Drive your ambition.